Um, morning, everybody. Afternoon. 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 I'm going from Philly today. Um, how's everybody doing? Great. 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 This is an awesome day. I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Joe DeFelice. I'm regional administrator with Hudson Mid Atlantic Region. Uh, what does that mean? I was appointed by the president uh, to serve Secretary Carson in this role. I cover Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. Um, and before I kind of get into some of the script here, I want to want to thank your board chair, Davey, and, and, and Ed, your executive director, for having us today. Uh, we, and I know it was a quick turnaround. I know it was a quick turnaround, and I do, I do appreciate uh, you doing that. Um, so this region's a pretty vast region, and I try to get out for this region as much as possible. I've probably been in the Tidewater area, what, 25 times now in the last two and a half years? I mean, we spent a lot of time down there. Not as much in Portsmouth, but we've been in Norfolk, Newport News, uh, Virginia Beach. Surrey, uh, James City, uh, you name it, we've been up and down this area. I was even in, I know it's not Tide River, I was up, spent a couple, we were in Tangier Island. Um, that was interesting. If anyone's ever been, if you haven't, you should go. Um, just open as an eye opener. Um, so, uh, but the, the reason what we do is we try to get around the region as much as possible, really to, to hear. And we're going to hear stories today. Um, what you're going to hear a lot of times is, you know, there's a lot of really smart people in Washington that make a lot of really good decisions, but a lot of times some of those decisions don't always flat with what works in the local market, what's work talking to regular people. So that is why we get out and we do these things. That's why I come here. That's why my counterpart, Chris Patterson, is coming in from California today to tell his story. To, to not only to hear, tell, hear our stories, but to listen to you all about what we can take back up to Washington, to let them know that it's not up for us to dictate down, but it's up for us to dictate up. And that's kind of one of the reasons that we're here today. Uh, Carrie Schmidt is here with us today. Carrie uh, runs our Richmond Field Office, which essentially covers all the good parts of Virginia, which doesn't include Northern <laughs> Park, right? Correct. <laughs> that's right. Um, They're good, based, too. Uh, she's based out of Richmond. Uh, we have Rob Davenport here. Uh, Rob runs our uh, public housing out of our Richmond office for the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. We have a couple other staffers here. We have uh, Ed. Ed's here. We have uh, Megan. Where's Megan? Megan's over there. And the diet is over here. So they're both new. So we want to keep them. <laughs> be nice. um, and I know we have some representatives from uh, Senator Kane's office and Congressman Scott's office. So I spent time with both of your bosses uh, on numerous occasions. I, I, I recounted my meeting with Senator Kane when I first came on. The only elected official, either in the House or Senate, that had requested to see me. And I went over, uh, I guess it was the, was in the Russell Building? Yes. You know, went over the Russell Building, we sat down, and after about 15 minutes, we were talking minor league baseball and restaurants. <laughs> and I guess he had played in a band, too, or something. So he, he plays talked, a harmonica. Yeah, he <laughs> talked about playing in the band. So, um, anyway, uh, enough of the pleasantries. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, today is my pleasure to announce the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is awarding 100. Thirteen thousand and one hundred and seventy-five thousand and one hundred and seventy dollars. I'm gonna redo that again, and then you guys can cut it out. <laughs> um, today is my pleasure to announce the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is awarding one hundred thirteen thousand one hundred and seventy dollars to the Portsmouth Redevelopment and Housing Authority. Um, but what's not important, but what's important about this announcement is not the money. It's, it's that the funding award will provide housing for 14 young people. HUD's Foster Youth in to Independence Initiative, that's our FYI initiative, provides housing assistance and supportive services to young people with a child welfare history who are at risk of experiencing homelessness. FYI, in conjunction with local resources, will help communities ensure that every young person who has been in foster care has access to safe, affordable housing and a support network to help them reach self-sufficiency by working towards their education and employment goals. In a moment, you'll meet Chris Patterson, my counterpart from the West Coast, who's been appointed by HUD Secretary Ben Carson to lead this important new initiative. Chris will tell you more about how, the, how this program came to be and why it's so important to him and our agency to serve the young people. You'll hear from our local resource partners, including Pamela Little Hill, who directs Portsmouth's Department, of Social Services, the agency that identifies the youth that will be helping, and Ms. Darlene Sparks Washington, who in addition to her day job as Executive Director of the Portsmouth Volunteers for the Homeless, also serves our partners by leading the Portsmouth Homeless Action Consortium Continuum of Care, and that is a mouthful, uh, this collective, the collective of area agencies working with us to end homelessness here in the Tidewater area. We also have a few young people, some of who I met today, um, who in their words will tell you why this is so important. 
What you may not realize is that this is actual because of a few individuals, individuals like the ones with us today, who have aged out of the foster care system and they either experienced or were at risk of becoming homeless, took it upon themselves to make an appointment with Secretary Carson. Within four months, we launched the FYI program. Since that program launched last year, HUD helped house more than 250 youth who have aged out of the foster care system. But that's not what I'm really proud of. I'm proud that this is the third award of FYI vouchers in the Mid-Atlantic region, as well as the third award in the Tidewater area of Virginia. That says a lot about the focus of the area and the agencies assisting youth who are exiting foster care. They understand the importance housing plays and how it's a good start in life. I'll tell you a little bit about my story, and you're going to hear Chris's story, and it's going to be a lot better than mine. But um, I, uh, I spent time, if you will, as a juvenile delinquent um, when I was in high school. I had been suspended from school 12 times. I've been arrested. I had spent time in the Youth Study Center. I would call in to my probation officer. Uh, every night at 8 o'clock to let them know I was in the house. Um, and I had two parents at home, two parents that were there every day. When I turned 18, those two parents were there. And I was able to get that past behind me, and I went on to college. And I graduated from college, and I went on to law school. And I graduated from law school. You know what I did when I graduated from law school? I came home. My, now, my father had passed at that point, but I came home to my mom. And every night, there was food on the table. I'm 26 years old. I'm not 18. There's food on the table, my clothes are washed, the electric bill's paid, the cable bill's paid, got my first cell phone, which I think I actually paid for that. Um, but I'm trying to, to explain that here I am, a law school graduate, a high school and college graduate, and I have this safety net. And I, and I had been in that, I had been in a rough spot, and I could have gone either way, but I had that safety net built around me. I ended up moving out of the house when I was 27 because I was able to save the money over that time to buy my first home. Not a lot of our youth are afforded that same opportunity. And this is an opportunity to provide maybe a little bit of that safety net. And with that, I would like to introduce Chris Patterson, who's going to tell you his story and how it came to be and why he's here today leading this national initiative. Chris? He is a large part of this. <laughs> It's kind of funny when you stand next to the podiums and you realize that they don't make it for people that are actually where the mic needs to be. So I typically get away from the podiums now because I don't like them. Uh, I actually feel like I'm standing next to people like Joe, which I can <laughs> I'm not used to that. Uh, on behalf of Secretary Carson, uh, I think the biggest thing that we want to express is out of the 24,000 vouchers from the Foster Youth Independence <coughs> Initiative, this is something that is very easy to buy into for all parties. This is not Democrat, this is not Republican, this is bipartisan support. This is something that every single person at the Capitol, whether it's Rayburn or any of them with the senators, you think about where this can go. We essentially could end youth homelessness from the foster care side mm -hmm. if we all work with each other to get them from the point they age out of foster care, like myself, like Cameron, like others who are here in, this, in Fort Smith. You know, it's, it's pretty important to think about the story when you realize where they've come from and where they can go. What they can go to is something entirely different where the story is written for them from their past. So why do I want to focus on my past story? I don't. It's not a scarlet letter. It's not something I'm going to wear as a badge of honor. It's something that made me who I am today. I'm happy that I ended up where I was. I'm glad that I actually had the chance to go through Boston. I know that sounds strange, but it made me the tenacious very determined man I am today and I think having that opportunity to set the stage for kids aging out of the foster care system is very crucial uh, one of the stories I'd like to talk about is with Christian in Santa Ana you know he was in the system for quite some time uh, probably a couple of years ago he ended up living on the streets and then being hit by a car where he had a traumatic brain injury but because he had no housing he was living in shelters and then to, to go from one stroke of bad luck to the next stroke of bad luck where you actually get hit by a car, you have brain damage, to where his life has now changed forever. So it was one of those happiest moments where I actually got to see him in his apartment. It was on the LA Times, it was in Orange County Press, it was everything to showcase where his moment where he's changing his life to where we can see something different for the future. That's something you can't buy. Those moments like that are so precious and so unusual for people to actually think that it's real. It is real. There was 20 plus foster kids that helped create this initiative. 
in record speed time out of DC. Now, if any of you know what DC is like, that's impossible. So for four months from the time of inception to the meetings when this, these former foster youth met with the secretary, they created, developed, wrote, and implemented this that fast. So when the secretary had appointed me to be the, the nationwide lead on in July, it was a big honor to realize that, hey, look, because you don't talk about going through foster care. You don't talk about what you're going to do. It's not something you bring up all the time, unless you're with former foster kids, because you really can't tell. You can go to knuckle to knuckle. You're going to talk to them. You're going to talk shock or talk shock language with them and things like that. But it's really not going to be something, you know, as, as the state child welfare director, she's going to know exactly what I'm referring to. These kids know what BS is. Mm -hmm. They know what it's not is. We're here to make sure that this is something you guys realize is valued, important, and something that we recognize is crucial to change. We have a chance to do something uh, with my fellow RA, Joe DeFelice, all my other fellow RAs. This is something we're all passionate about. It's something that Secretary Carson wants to see something change. You don't spend a lot of time on things just to have it die. You spend time on things to make sure you grow. It comes to fruition. It's like planting that garden. It's like raising your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids. You want to pour everything into it so that they have a chance to succeed. That's what this is about. When you think about all those former foster kids that spent the time, the secretary spent the time, the HUD employees spent the time, this is something that everybody is easily willing to buy into with no hesitation. And I think it's something that you can live with very peacefully, knowing at the end of the time when you meet your maker, you can go knowing that we all did this together. So I want to say thank you. I could bore you with more statistics, but I can tell you out of the 24, 20 plus thousand kids of foster care who go through that life, it's tough. I would, myself was from birth until five, went into an adoption, failed adoption, went back into 12, from 12 on I was in foster care, uh, and I had no option. When that, when that magical date of graduation came out, you need to leave because we no longer get funded to keep you in our house. So it was, there was two choices, Marine Corps and Job Corps. Well, they were both good for me. So I chose the Job Corps. Uh, that Cameron, put me on the spot, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I know he just told me that he's actually looking to get in the Job Corps. It's a chance to change your direction, to learn a trade, to pay your bills, to take care of yourself, because you can't take care of your family until you take care of yourself first. And that's what the Secretary expects. He expects us to push this support it, and make sure that everything we do represents a positive turn. So without anything other, any other information, I'd like to hand it back to Joe. And thank you very much for your time. We'll be here for a while to talk. Thanks, Chris. And um, what we didn't say, actually, so this is the, this, well, I did say, this is the third, um, third cohort of, of funding um, on the FYI specifically in the um, Tidewater area. So we were total now, if you add up what we uh, put in Newport News, Chesapeake, and now Portsmouth, we're at 51 total vouchers, totaling roughly $450 million. So, I mean, that's pretty impressive, and, and I'm sure there'll be more to come, but it's a heck of a star. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'd like to bring um, up some of the people that, that, that made this possible. Um, Ed. And, and the work you guys are doing, why don't you come up here, and then Pam and, and, and Darlene, please come up as well, and kind of tell your stories, and, um, and then you can, Pam, you can invite up some of the younger ones and tell their stories, all right? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Um, I'm looking at Ms. Winston because when PRHA approached the Department of Social Services with the opportunity to partner in this grant, it was really a no-brainer for us. <laughs> it was like, when, what do you need, when does I have to get in? Because this is exciting. And it is exciting because, as you know, we didn't have this. These opportunities were not there. And when we look at working with our children, especially DSS, we're always trying to look for what are those service gaps? What are those disconnects? What are these areas that we need to fill in the gaps from? And it's how do we do it? And funding is a major part of that. Um, yes, we have volunteers and people assist, but, uh, assist us, but without the dollars, um, we can do very little. 
Um, the children that are going into the young adults into this program are individuals that are signed into our Fostering Futures program. And Fostering Futures, if I had to explain it to you, is when the children have the opportunity to leave foster care at the age of 18. This is an option where they can stay in for an additional period of time to get ongoing support. That can be other support services or educational services. And how do we assist them and coach them until they leave for independence? So what we heard um, spoken about today was those natural supports or family members that a lot of us have. And I'm one of those moms where I'm always trying to tell my daughter how you blessed you are. <laughs> because some of them just don't realize it. They don't have the, the supports that sometimes we take for granted. I often say in social services, when we all go home and open up a refrigerator, we actually expect food to be in it. When we turn on that light switch, we actually expect something to come on. I don't know if it's going to stay on, but we expect it to come on. <laughs> um, and in doing that, those are sometimes those just little things that you don't think about day to day. So now I'm going to ask you to think about somebody who's 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. What's in your head? What do I need to think about? I am transitioning from, or trying to transition from, adolescence to adulthood. Some people have other supports, and some of them are on their own. And that is really scary. It is scary to do. So for us having the opportunity to partner with this program, why it means so much to me, is because DSS, we have a vested interest in making sure they are successful. Um, we're going to give it everything we got. <laughs> um, because we want to see more of these types of vouchers and opportunities come in for our young men and women. Um, and what I'd like to say also to the Secretary is thank you so much. This opportunity that you have provided these young people is awesome. It helps us to do what it is that we need to do, that most of us love to do. And now we feel like we have a, a, a whole other avenue to get up that energy again and say, okay, it's not over yet. <laughs> because some people need a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. That's that thing with, I'm 18 and I'm grown. You're not 18 and grown. There's, there's other supports and, and knowledge you need to know. I was just talking to Michaela, and the last thing I'm going to say to you is I said, I think about it like this. Our job will be to provide them with the skills and trainings that they need to be successful. Putting you into an apartment without the tools and skills you need to maintain self-sufficiency, I look at it as a disservice. It's, it's one thing to give them an apartment. It's another thing to help them maintain it. And that is a big thing. And when we look at the training program that we're going to develop for them to help them with self-sufficiency in our partnership with PRHA, we're going to talk to them about those little things people forget. And the example I gave Mikhail was, um, I'm one of those where I'm fortunate that my husband beats me home so he can cook. <laughs> <laughs> and when he does that, um, I'm thankful for that. Um, but at the same time, I'm that person. I need a recipe from A to Z. Mm -hmm. So when you give me something, you have to tell me everything. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go, well, Good, good cooks go, well, you put this in it, you put that in it, and, and it works out, and it should be good. I'm going to do exactly what you say, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say, mine didn't turn out that way. Mm -hmm. That's what happens with our years. We, I think as adults, we attempt to train them and give them all the information that we have, but sometimes we leave out those little bits of information that are so vital to help people be successful. Mm -hmm. Those are the gaps DSS are going to work on and cover with them so that we can ensure success. So again, we thank you for this opportunity. So good afternoon. I'm Darlene Sparks Washington with Portsmouth Volunteers for the Homeless. But I'm here today representing um, the Portsmouth Homeless Action Consortium, which is PHAC. And PHAC is a collection of homeless providers within the city. Um, I represent um, Virginia Supportive Housing, Oasis Social Ministry, Park the Planning Council, um, and a couple more. And so we come together, and as we have been looking at what our issues are and our opportunities are, the age gap is 18 to 24. As the person at Portsmouth Volunteers for the Homeless, where we do a night shelter program, we have had individuals show up on our doorstep who have aged out of the foster system, needing support. So you've heard it before, this particular opportunity is a safety net. 
it is a very welcomed safety net to provide our young people with an opportunity to move forward with the skills and the knowledge and the support, the coaching that's actually needed. A lot of times it's just that case manager who tells you you can, you can, and you deserve it. And then you start to believe, I can, I can, and I deserve it. And once our mindset changes, our actions change. And that's why these opportunities are so very, very important. So on behalf of the providers for PHAC um, and Portsmouth Volunteers for the Homeless, we thank you so much for this opportunity. And we wish so much the best that it will be put to good use. Thank you all so much. So at this time, I'm going to introduce you to two of the participants of our Fostering Futures program. First, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Mikhail Fox to come up and tell us a little bit about herself and what this program means to her. Hello, my name is Mikhail. I'm a Fostering Future participant at 18. And I have been in care since 2014. The reason why this program is beneficial is because two days after I turned 18, I had nowhere to live because of the choice that I made. It was the worst fair I had ever come into. But I got to say that I'm blessed because I did locate housing, but I was dependent on someone else. I will now be able to depend on myself and I learned some other things to be on my own completely. Thank you for this opportunity. And now I'd like to present to you, Mr. Cameron Jeffers. Good afternoon, y'all folks. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Cameron Jeffers. I've been in foster care for three years now, and I turned 18 in foster care. I'm 18 years old now. Um, I didn't, when I first got out of foster care, I didn't have no family to go to um, or no friends I could stay with. So at the time, I had to live how I lived. And um, then at one point, I ended up starting paying some rent with the money that Social Services was helping me out with. And um, I'm doing a little bit better now, but with this new program, will give me a better opportunity to become self-sufficient and not have to depend on other people. And that's all I got to say. So thank y'all and have a nice day. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Michaela. And and that's well, why that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And 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 one of the things we kept talking about was self sufficiency. And that's been a, a large theme of, of Secretary Carson's tenure as a Secretary of HUD. Um, Pam, if it makes you feel any better, I had. A, but this, these, these won't be broadcast in Philly. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I literally had to tell my wife how to make a hard boiled egg. <laughs> I said, boil the water and just throw the egg in for a while and then just take it out. But uh, so, thankfully, I'm doing the cooking, so I got to get out of here. <laughs> but uh, to be honest with you, the self sufficiency piece, and you're going to see, you've been seeing a lot, if you haven't already, you'll be seeing a lot more of it with HUD. Um, if you're familiar with our Section 3 program, many of you are, many of you may not be. Section 3 essentially says any money that the federal government, specifically HUD, is spending in your community, 30% of the workforce must come from that community. That's right. Amen. Right? Come from that community. So the mindset, if you're an electrician, if you're a bricklayer, if you're a landscaper, if you're doing social media, you know, like 30% of the workforce. And too many people have gotten around it for too long, so you'll be hearing about a new rule and, and the way we're looking at it coming out shortly that will directly benefit the people that we serve. Because the goal, frankly, is to... Maybe provide that safety net, provide that step up, but then also help you take that step out so we can backfill some of these waiting lists that we have out there. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring up some of the team. Michaela, Cameron, Pauline, Pam, Ed, Katie, Carrie. I'm going to do this again. It's a check presentation. Did I miss somebody? No, the check. I know. <laughs> I said the check presentation. And Chris. I'm sorry. Oh, you're proper. You're okay, too. I'm sorry. Everyone's okay. 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 Okay.
in front of that picture. None of the darkness. All of it. Okay, straighten the check up on this side. Young lady, put your hand on this. Some of this yours. There you go. All right, everyone, look over here. Your white piece of paper, put it behind if you don't mind, please. All right, here we go. Believe it or not, I do have everyone there. Nice smile, hold it right there. Bam! Stay there for me. Second shot, coming in on your nice smile there. Bam! Thank you. All right. Everybody else out there get it? Hold on, we got a couple more in the back. Um, and with that, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't make one more plug. Uh, um, Secretary Carson's, um, I guess, I guess you could say it's his prime initiative uh, outside of um, the Foster uh, Youth Initiative is Envision Centers. Envision Centers are continuing on that self-sufficiency theme. Are, are places that are kind of one-stop shops for growth, right? For self-sufficiency. Uh, they focus on uh, educational opportunity, economic advancement, character and leadership, and health and wellness. We recently have opened 47 across the country. We have two here in Tidewater, uh, one in Norfolk and one in Newport News. That doesn't mean we can't have one in, in Portsmouth. So we will be in touch, Carrie, Robert, right, with Portsmouth awesome. to talk about potentially opening an Envision Center here. And right now, I mean, just with Norfolk and Newport News, they're the, they're the two closest. We had one more here. And I still don't understand why this area doesn't have a professional sports team. There's like, well, 1.8 million people there. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming. Because I was watching, I saw that. Did anyone else watch the Michael Vick documentary? Yeah. 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 Played with him. Did you play with him? Yeah, I played against him. We graduated the uh, same year, 1998. He was okay. in New York. I went to actually know him. Yeah. Really? Yeah. How about that? See, I'm an Eagles fan. Die hard. Okay. So Got he came to Philly. We weren't expecting that. He just came in as a third string quarterback. So I spent some time with his, his aunt, Tina, when I go up to Got the new producer. Anyway, that was an aside. Envision <laughs> Centers, I'm making a plug. We're going to do it. So, Ed, you want to close this out? Right, thank you. Okay. Well, on, on behalf of the housing authority, really, we're looking forward to working with the Department of Social Service and helping uh, kids who are transitioning out of foster care to be to get permanent housing. Yeah. And with that, we're getting 14, so I'm going to put a uh, charge out to Social Service where we can get another 11 for a total of 25. So. <laughs> find 11 more so we can make an application we to get 11 that. more vouchers. Then we have a total of 25 and we can continue to build upon that. And once again, coming from the Housing Authority, uh, we're really looking forward to this. 